Good evening. Thank you for being with us for this midweek Bible study. Tonight we're going to be looking at the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to talk about vessels of light. What are your favorite lights during the holiday season? Are they the ones on your tree? Maybe the ones on your house? It could be a candle in a centerpiece on your table or maybe a candle in the window. I'm not sure which is your favorite, but I think during the holiday season, lights both originated and continue to remind us of greater lights, the light of love. And in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we're going to be reading about vessels of light because you see, you and I are to be lights in this world. It's an exciting study, a timely study for us, and I look forward to beginning in just a moment. But before we do, we've got some announcements that I'd like to share with you. Let's remember that we have several uh, who are sick at this time, and be mindful of the Perry family. Uh, Mike Perry's mother, Catherine, and his daughter, Natalie, are suffering with COVID, as well as Brenda uh, Harden's grandson, Troy Harden. And there are others, uh, we don't mention everybody, but if, if, if uh, there's a special request, we like to share that so that you can be praying. Remember, there are several who are having some heart troubles. Tim Rose, Robin Maxwell's brother, Jerry uh, Russell, Diane Spence's brother, and the sister of, of Wilma Dillon, Janice Dillon, all having some heart troubles at this time. I also ask for you to continue to remember Andrew's brother, who has really had a lengthy ordeal. Also, be praying for Gina Lindsay's mom and dad. Some of you know they've had some health difficulties, and it's pretty serious. We just ask you to continue to remember the family. We're thankful that uh, Wayne Sawyer's at home recovering, and also Flo Overstreet, and just thankful that God above hears our prayers and blesses those whom we love. Well, at this time, we're going to go to the Word of God. We're in the book of Acts. We're in the last chapter, chapter 28. And I want us to look at this text from verse 21 and verse 22. It tells us that they said to him, this is Paul meeting with Jews in Rome after his arrival there to stand trial. They said to him, We have received no letters from Judea about you, and none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken any evil about you. But we desire to hear from you what your views are. For with regard to this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. Thank you, Lord, for your holy word. We pray you'll bless the reading of this scripture. At this time, we're going to have a word of prayer. We have a guest who's going to lead us. It's uh, Brother Robert Lupo from the Sneedville Church of Christ, and we're thankful that he'll bring our prayer at this time. Hello, Old Hickory Church of Christ. This is Robert Lupo coming to you from just down the road in Hancock County, Tennessee. I preach for the little congregation known as the Sneedville Church of Christ. And we have been in fellowship with Old Hickory for several years now as fellow laborers in the kingdom of heaven. And we are so blessed to have you helping us both with your prayers, but also with your financial contributions. 2020 has been a good year, as well as a somewhat rough year as we've struggled with the onset of the COVID-19 virus. On January 1st, 2020, we baptized Travis Livesey into Christ, starting out the new year right. But as many of you know, with the onset of the COVID virus, we've had our struggles, and I'm sure that you have as well. We have not had very many Bible studies since January, but we've managed to have a few. Our latest Bible study has been with 40-year-old Brandy Kephart, and that was Thanksgiving week. We started out on a Monday before Thanksgiving, visiting with her after she received an invitation through House to House, Heart to Heart, 
to receive a copy of a study Bible. And we asked to bring it to her in person and she accepted our invitation. And we met with her, my wife and I, for about, a, uh, about an hour and a half. We had a good visit with her. In fact, she stated that she felt as though she had known us all her lives and could talk to us about anything. We planned to have a Bible study with her the very next evening, having dinner and then a Bible study afterward. But that was interrupted with family that came to visit her from out of town. And then later in the week, Dolores and I developed the COVID virus. And so we have been struggling to get our strength back, but it is coming back slowly. And we plan to visit with Brandy and with her cousin in the very near future. We are going to be having services for the first time in several weeks tomorrow. That is December 20th. But we are glad to be able to be with you and we ask you to continue to remember us in your prayers, both for the remainder of this year, but also in the year to come. I've been asked to say a prayer with you, and I invite you to bow your heads with me at this time. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we are truly grateful to you to be able to call you our God, to be able to call you our Savior and our Redeemer. Father, we are so thankful for your Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life on Calvary's cross to purchase the church with his own blood and to redeem the world of its sin. Father, help us as your children not to be ashamed and not to be afraid to tell others wherever we are of the saving grace that you have provided to this world. Help us to preach it and to teach it from the housetops. Help us not to be ashamed, Father, but help us to be shining examples of the gospel and to teach the gospel wherever we are as we live among the lost in this world. Father, we're thankful both for the blessings and for the struggles of this year past that is almost finished as these struggles and these trials and these blessings help us to realize our dependence upon you, but also to remind us of the hope that we have some eternal day. Father, help us not to lose sight of this hope and help us to turn the struggles of the year past into the victories of the year to come. Especially, Father, Help us to turn these struggles into an eternal victory as we look forward to living with you someday, some eternal day. Father, we thank you for your church the world over, and we ask you to bless us wherever we are. Help us to be that shining light and help us, Father, to maintain our faith and love for you even more so in the future than we have in the past. We ask these things in the blessed name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. It is so good to be able to pray with you today. And I hope that this brings you some comfort and some joy for the future that we have in Christ Jesus. May God bless you. And may God bless the Lord's church. Thank you, Robert. And at this time, Mason Hale has a song for us. We're grateful that he makes these available. It's just wonderful, his talents and abilities. And we look forward to singing with Mason at this time. Let's sing, Come Thou Almighty King. Come Thou Almighty King. Help us thy name to sing, help us to praise. Father all glorious, soar all victorious, come and reign over us, ancient of days. Come thou incarnate word, 
Gird on thy mighty sword, our prayer attend. Come and thy people bless and give thy word success. Spirit of holiness on us descend. Come thou almighty king. What a beautiful thought. Tonight we're studying, we said, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and our theme in the series of lessons is a call to recommit. The Corinthians had been uh, very vibrant and active when Paul went there and established the church, but some things had happened in his absence. And he's come back to uh, speak to them through this letter in preparation of a coming visit to try and reconnect with these people and, and to get them to reconnect with their responsibilities. In this chapter, he talks to them through some analogies about what it means to be a Christian. And he mentions a few things. One is that we as Christians are vessels of light. We started talking about our favorite lights, but Paul's favorite light is the light of the gospel that shines in the heart of God's people. He's also going to talk about jars of clay, vessels of light, jars of clay. Well, let's look at our text. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 begins, Therefore, having this ministry, he has a ministry, a service to render, one that he said had been full of challenges and difficulties. At times he felt the sentence of death had been passed upon him. He didn't see any way out. Having this ministry, he says, by the mercy of God, even though it was difficult, he saw it as a blessing and as a privilege. And it was by the mercy of God on the road to Damascus that he was able to receive forgiveness of his sins, to be commissioned to carry the gospel to the Gentiles of the world. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, not self-appointed, but by God, we do not lose heart. Now, that's the message of this lesson. Hang around, we're going to talk about more, but he begins and ends with this thought. Do not lose heart. We do not lose heart. You should not lose heart. And yet it's so easy to do. When you become a Christian in the beginning, you're filled with enthusiasm and joy. And along the way, the difficulties of life can weigh on you. 2020 is weighing on you. COVID is weighing on you. The election is weighing on you. <laughs> but don't lose heart because God is still upon his throne. He still loves and blesses his people. And Paul says we need to keep things in perspective. So if you're thinking clearly, if you're thinking biblically, if you're thinking correctly, even in the midst of all kinds of difficulties, you do not have to lose heart. You do not have to give up. He says... We don't lose heart. We keep on preaching. We keep on teaching. But here's what we have done. We have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. Now, why would he bring this up? Because there are people there who were troubling that church, who were making charges against Paul, saying he's not really an apostle, that he's a self-promoter, he's a demagogue, he's a false teacher and the way that he teaches is just it's filled with deceit he says oh no i'm going to keep preaching the same message i'm not going to stop i'm not going to lose heart no matter what anybody says about me he says we have renounced though disgraceful underhanded ways. You know, the fact is that those who were making these charges against Paul, they were the ones engaged in disgraceful, underhanded behavior. Paul says, we refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. 
That is, we're not going to twist Scripture. We're not going to pervert Scripture. We are going to speak the truth in love. He says, here's how we operate. Instead of tampering with God's Word, by the open statement of the truth, you shall know the truth. There is a truth. The truth is knowable. The truth will set you free. And he says, by the open statement, just clearly presenting the Word of God, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience. And I think he's saying here he wasn't trying to play politics in the congregation. He wasn't trying to appeal to people's prejudices or, or to partisans. He's preaching to every man. And he believes that if their heart is good, that their conscience is on the side of truth. So that's his appeal. It's very simple, very straightforward. But he says, and we're doing this in the sight of God. That we're not trying to hurt anyone, mislead anyone. God knows. God sees. There's nothing underhanded. There's nothing crooked, nothing deceptive. It is simply the truth. I think that's important for us to remember today. A lot of times people are trying to draw large crowds with a lot of different techniques and methods. How about this? Let's just have the open statement of the truth, the simple gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's share that with all people. Let's just appeal to the conscience and let the Word of God do its work. Now he goes on to say, and even if our gospel is veiled, because some people were saying it's a little hard to understand what Paul talks about. Well, he says, uh, if that's true, it is veiled only to those who are perishing. Because he says, in their case, the God of this world, who is that? That's Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. He talks about this veil, this covering that is not just over the face, but over the minds of people so that they don't see clearly, they don't understand. The God of this world has blinded the minds of these unbelievers. It's not that the truth can't be known, but something's going on in the mind. Something's going on in the heart. It's not that it couldn't be understood, but there's something at work that's keeping people from embracing the gospel. He says the God of this world, Satan, is doing this to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Now, in the last chapter, he talked about Moses, who, when he came down from the mountain, put a veil over his face because his face was shining. In this case, Paul makes a comparison. It's not the face of Moses, but it's the face of Christ that is filled with glory. The face of Moses, the glory was dwindling. With the face of Christ in the image of God, it is abounding. Now Moses wore that veil. In this case, it says Satan is the one who's putting the veil over people's eyes, over their minds, to keep them from seeing the beauty of the life of Jesus Christ, to keep them from seeing the light of of the gospel, of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Now, that's a beautiful picture. He's talking about light. And the light he's talking about is the gospel. It is the gospel about Jesus. It is the glory of his image being received through enlightenment that is possible in the preaching of the gospel, the open statement of the truth. So he says, if there's a problem here, Satan is behind it. And he says, for what we proclaim, verse 5, is not ourselves as he was being accused of doing, 
What we proclaim is not ourselves. We're not trying to promote ourselves. We don't want followers for ourselves. But Jesus Christ as Lord with ourselves as your servants, not your overlords, not your bosses, but here to help you and bless you and teach you and support you. We are your servants. That's all we are, servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That Jesus is the image of God. That when you see him, you're seeing divinity. You're seeing God. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Now look at this image. God who said, let light shine out of darkness. There in the book of Genesis in chapter 1, let there be light. And we know that in our hearts, before we receive the gospel, there's darkness. The world in the first creation was dark, without light, was formless, was void. And he's making a comparison about what God did in the beginning to a second and new creation. That through the gospel, God is speaking to us again, saying, let there be light. When did the apostle Paul see that light? He was in darkness, the darkness of hatred, persecuting Christians, destroying the church. When did that happen? On the road to Damascus. He saw this light above the brightness of the sun. And you know, the Bible is constantly talking about, about light. There's the light of the star of Bethlehem that led the wise men to our Lord. There's the light of the glorified Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. The New Testament is filled with these magnificent stories of light, and we could go on enumerating them because they are many. But he says, this light shines in our hearts, in his heart, but also ours, to give. What are we supposed to do? You're supposed to be the light of the world. The light of the knowledge, knowledge of what? Of the glory of God. How? In sharing Christ, in the face of Jesus Christ. You are a vessel of light, but you're also a jar of clay. He goes on to say this, beginning in verse 7, as he switches analogies. But we have this treasure, light is treasure. Truth is treasure. It is the treasure hidden in a field. It is the pearl of great price, this knowledge of the gospel, this knowledge of Jesus Christ. And we have this treasure in jars of clay. This is one of those paradoxes because clay is not worthless, but it's pretty close when compared to things of greater value. He's talking about jars, which are receptacles, jars, which are containers. And he's talking about this earthen body. He's talking about our flesh. But this glorious gospel that God lets it dwell in us as we receive that message, as we come to see Christ, he dwells in our hearts. He dwells in our minds. We have, we have treasure, this treasure in jars of clay. There are folks who think they're rich who are absolutely poor. And there are those who don't have a lot in this world materially, but they are truly the most blessed, wealthiest, richest people in all the world. We have this treasure in jars of clay. And he says the reason for this, that God had planned this. God in his wisdom had a purpose to show that the surpassing power, that is the greatest power in existence, the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. 
The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. It is sin-forgiving power. It is life-changing power. And the power doesn't rest in us. It's not our wisdom. It's not how articulate we are. It is the message of truth. It is the open statement of truth that works on the consciences of the open-hearted. He says, as far as we're concerned, we're afflicted. Here we are in these brittle bodies. And he says, we're afflicted. He's talked about affliction from the very beginning. He says God is the God of uh, mercy and comfort. And he talks about his afflictions and their afflictions. And he comes back to that theme because it was their experience at this time. He says, we're afflicted in every way. It's not just a little, it's a lot. It's not just occasionally, it's ongoing. We are afflicted in every way. But he says this, we are not crushed. Satan wants to crush us. But God takes that affliction and uses it to our, our benefit. We're perplexed, but not driven to despair. There's things that confuse us. We don't always see at the moment exactly what God is doing, but we don't have to be driven to despair. We can choose faith, trust. He says uh, that we are persecuted, but not forsaken. That when all these bad things are happening, just like in the life of Joseph, when he might have given up and thought when he was thrown into a pit and sold into slavery and uh, misrepresented in the trial. And then he ends up in prison. Then he's forgotten by the butler. He might have thought, God doesn't care about me. I don't think he even knows I exist. But that's not true. In our affliction, we are not forsaken. He says, struck down, but not destroyed. Okay, a lot of hard things happening. But we're not obliterated. We're not destroyed. Here we are. God has delivered us. He'll keep on delivering us until He just transports us to glory. And we can live with Him in peace and joy in heaven throughout eternity. I think Paul's reflecting on different experiences in his life and ministry. When he talks about being hard-pressed, it reminds me of his time in Damascus. Because pressed, you think of the idea of pressure coming from different directions. And it was both Jews and Gentiles who were after him. But you remember, he was let down with a basket and escaped the city and continued his, his evangelistic efforts. When it talks about the idea of him being um, perplexed, I think about Troas. He kept wanting to preach. Should I preach over here? Should I preach over there? And the Holy Spirit is saying, no, not here in Mysia, not here in Bithynia. And yet God was moving him to Philippi, into Macedonia, the place he needed most to be. So we're not driven to despair. We continue to trust that God is working. He, he mentions here persecuted, I think, about Philippi and being thrown into jail the innermost uh, cell and put in the stocks and all the beating and all of the affliction that he suffered there. Now, all of these things that happen, including being struck down when he was stoned at, at Lystra, all of these things that are happening did not mean the end. Not crushed, not despairing, not forsaken, not destroyed. Is that an important message for you today? There's a lot going on in this world. Isn't it wonderful that we can have peace that passes understanding because we know who we belong to, because we have the light of the gospel. We know the end. We know the hidden realities that others can't see. And when you have this enlightenment that comes through revelation, your experience of life, your experience even of affliction, is totally different from those who are without faith and without hope. 
So he continues. He says, we're always carrying in the body the death of Jesus. And I, I'm not sure if he's saying there that there's a target on our backs and that Satan will use many human agents to uh, work against us. Or if he's also saying that, that we live a crucified life. If any man come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. But in any case, he says, this is our experience. We're carrying around in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus may be manifested in our bodies. Is there affliction? Yes. But it's in the, in the midst of this, this spiritual renewal and spiritual confidence that we have so that this life, this eternal life, this abundant life is even greater than the physical things that we're suffering. We want the life of Christ to be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you, that what we're doing and suffering is for you. We suffer, God comforts, we comfort you. There's a purpose behind all of this. Now he says in verse, verse 13, since we have this same spirit of faith, this is the difference maker, this spirit of faith, according to what has been written, it is through for you and me today, this revelation of Jesus Christ. He's mentioning what is written, particularly, I believe, in Psalm 116 and verse 10, where the psalmist said, I believed and so I spoke. It's a man who was experiencing a terrible illness. Sounds familiar. And yet he trusted in God. And God brought him through that time of, of difficulty and so he says, so I speak. So I praise God. I'm going to honor him for every blessing in my life. And Paul says, we also believe, and so we also speak. We believe Jesus is the Son of God. We believe that we're not forsaken by God. We believe in these hidden heavenly realities revealed to us through the gospel. We believe, so what do we do? This is what he said from the beginning. We do not lose heart. In the time of COVID, we do not quit preaching. We do not quit ministering. This book is a call to recommit even in times of adversity. So we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. That's the end of the story. It's a good ending. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving. And all of this, he says, to the glory of God. Do you like that, that trinity he speaks of here? Grace extended, thanksgiving increased, and the glory of God. That's what this is all about. Now in verse 16, he repeats what he said at the beginning. So we do not lose heart. Okay, we've got some challenges. In fact, he says, though our outward nature is wasting away, life can grind on you and physically uh, over time, your health can diminish. There can be physical ailments. There can be persecution. There can be just the, the weight of the cares of life. And he says, okay, that's true. You're getting older and life wears on you. And, and yet he says our inner nature is being renewed day by day. What does he mean day by day? 
that as your health may diminish, your faith may be strengthened. And your health may go down day by day. You feel a little weaker. But spiritually, you can be stronger. In the midst of all the difficulties that we're facing, you can be stronger. God makes that possible. Through all of Paul's affliction, he was not weaker. But in his weakness, God made him strong. So he says we can be renewed for this slight, momentary affliction. It's preparatory. It's preparing us for an eternal weight of glory. Eternal, unending. Weight, this outweighs that. You remember he said back at the end of the last chapter, We all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. And so he tells us here, we have an eternal weight of glory. that there is this sanctification going on and you can become stronger and you can become better even through difficulty. And in the end, all the things that you have suffered will not be worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in you. When you see Him, you will be like Him. Imagine for just a moment what the future holds. That's why it says in Colossians 3, set your affection on things above, not on the things of the earth. Glory. I sent through email today the words of a song. And I just want to think about some of these words with you for a moment. The song talks about glory. Glory for me. And in the first verse it says, When all my labors and trials are o'er, And I am safe on that beautiful shore, Just to be near the dear Lord I adore, Will through the ages be glory for me. When by the gift of His infinite grace, I am accorded in heaven a place, Just to be there and to look on His face, Will through the ages be glory for me. Friends will be there. I have loved long ago. Joy like a river around me will flow. Yet just a smile from my Savior, I know, will through the ages be glory for me. Would you sing the refrain with me? Oh, that will be glory for me, glory for me, glory for me. When by His grace I shall look on His face, that will be glory, be glory for me. Amen and amen. So he tells us that we have an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. It's like you have a balance. And on one end you put your afflictions, and on the other end you put God's comfort in this life and all of the promises that will be realized in eternity. He says, no comparison what God has prepared for you. So he says, what do we need to look at? As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, that are real and have true value. They are treasures. And through the enlightenment that comes through the gospel, we not only become light, we are givers of light, vessels 
of light. For the things that are seen, they're transient. This world is passing away, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we pray that you will help us to be vessels of light. As we see the beauty of seasonal lights today, let's be reminded, Father, help us to remember that, that just as those lights bring joy to people who are walking down the street or driving through the neighborhood, that our lives ought to bring blessings and joy to people as they can come to know Christ. Heavenly Father, help us also to realize that though our bodies are brittle, help us to realize that you can make us sufficient unto the job you've asked us to do. Help us to realize that we have treasure in these clay jars and help us to remember that you will not allow us to be crushed, to despair. Father, that you will not forsake us. You will not let us be destroyed. Father, we thank you for your Son. We thank you for the glory in His face. We pray that you'll help us to give that light throughout this holiday season and every day of our lives. Thank you for this privilege. Thank you for using us. Help us, Father, never to lose heart. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, thank you for being with us for class tonight. Don Loftus is going to be with you on Sunday talking about God's gifts again, God's unspeakable gift. And then Miles Cothamus, Sunday night is going to be a great systematic study of spiritual gifts. You won't want to miss that lesson. Well, I, I just ask God's blessings upon you and uh, hope you've enjoyed this Bible class. If you have a need, a spiritual need, be sure and contact us through ohcoc.com. Our contact information is there. It's oldhickorychurchofchrist.com. Because if you need to be baptized, or if you need to be restored, if you need prayer, if you just want to talk, we're here for you. You need to obey the gospel and enjoy these wonderful blessings we've been talking about tonight. Thank you for being with us, and God bless. Shadows flee.